Good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Golden. I am the Sandra Rothman Chair in Health Sector Strategy and a Professor of Strategic Management and the Academic Director of the Sandra Rothman Center for Health Sector Strategy at the Rothman School. Uh, I'm also the Academic Director of our Global Executive MBA for Healthcare and the Life Sciences. Uh, the Sandra Rothman Center is proud to host today's event. Uh, so thank you all for tuning in into our live stream. This is the second event of our digital health series this year, why is AI adoption in healthcare lagging? Although this event is taking place virtually, we always wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, while we're meeting virtually, Toronto is still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So we have a terrific panel for you tonight. Uh, professor Avi Goldfarb. Uh, Avi is the Rothman Chair Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Healthcare at the Robin School and Professor of Marketing, uh, one of my favorite colleagues, and I have many. Uh, and will present key ideas from his forthcoming book, A Power in Prediction, with commentary from three different vantage points. Helen Angus, former Deputy Minister of Health and CEO of AMS Healthcare, Dr. Chris O'Connor, internist and physician entrepreneur, and Dr. Amal Verma, internist and clinician scientist at Unity Health Toronto. Our host today uh, and always is moder uh, will moderate as Will Falk. A will is a senior fellow at the City Howe Institute and has an appointment with us here at the Rothman as the executive in, as an executive in residence. Uh, we always appreciate Will's involvement with all of our programs. Will is going to take us take it from here, but just before he does, a few words about our center. Uh, we are supported uh, by the school and the Rothman family, and we focus on three main areas, research and thought leadership on health sector challenges, uh, no shortage there, educational programming for emerging and senior leaders, and outreach activities like this one, on behalf of our students pursuing careers in healthcare management. And on the educational program, just a few words about our Global Executive MBA for Healthcare and Life Sciences. For short, we just call it HLS. Uh, this is an 18 month uh, global executive MBA program designed for working professionals in mid to senior positions in healthcare and the life sciences uh, from uh, both the commercial side and the healthcare delivery side. It's a full MBA customized for the health sector with a global focus. Our fifth cohort started last week in Toronto and we're now recruiting for the fall of 2023. Uh, you can see the slide there. This is the first time anyone has ever seen this slide because I've just added the new location uh, of Israel. We study in Toronto, uh, the UK, London, UK, Singapore, where I'll be heading to in a few hours. And now I'm proud to announce that we will be studying in the, one of the entrepreneurial capitals of the world, uh, Israel. So with no further ado, let me now hand it over to Will to kick off our program. You're all welcome to place comments and questions in the chat. We encourage that, and we'll do our best to address your queries. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Back to you, Will. For sure, and thank you, Brian, um, and uh, thank you, Rosemary, for everything that you do in making this uh, happen, and uh, thanks to Mike's son and others for technical support on this. Okay, uh, the idea today is we're going to do it a little bit differently than we have been for the last little while, in that we're going to give Avi some time to talk about power and prediction, which uh, is available now or available soon. And I spent the weekend in uh, the, the the afternoon in a hammock uh, making notes in my copy, uh, and have to say that. Uh, the weather and the book were both tremendous, um, some really interesting stuff. I found Avi and his co-author's first book absolutely superb. Um, it changed my thinking about artificial intelligence. And so I'm hoping we'll have a, a really interesting, wide-ranging discussion today. Um, Avi's going to present the main ideas in the book, and then the other three panelists, each of whom also have had a copy and had a chance to read it, are going to talk about it. Um, they each have a slightly different perspective, uh, both Amal and 
Chris, are, are practicing clinicians, um, one with a research interest, one with an entrepreneurial interest. And then Helen Angus, who's now the um, CEO of AMS Healthcare, was, of course, uh, uh, up until recently, our, um, a very accomplished senior civil servant and most recently Deputy Minister of Health in the province of Ontario. So we're going to try to take those points of views and kind of wrap through that and talk about it. Um, we're doing this in the digital health context because um, there's a kind of a presumption that AI starts with uh, digital as a substrate um, and uh, starts with, uh, with, with with data and pieces. And uh, I'm not going to say anything more other than to go over to Avi and have him uh, kick us off for 10 to 12 minutes. You're muted. Yeah. It's, it's uh, really an honor for uh, to be part of this panel. Um, such a thrill uh, that that I was invited to participate and to get the opportunity here to to hear and learn from Helen and Chris and Amo and Will uh, about their reactions to 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 these ideas and their and their own their own experiences and takes. So so thanks very much. Um, I'm really uh, as I said. So we we have this new book coming out. It's coming out in just under two weeks, November fifteenth, and you're going to be the first healthcare audience to get a peek at what we have to talk about. And this is with Ajay Agarwal, Joshua Gantz, who are uh, both also professors at the University of Toronto at Rotman. And so the, the starting point in thinking about AI in healthcare is the hope and the hype. Um, so we have you know, the hope, Eric Topol says, AI can make healthcare human again. Uh, you know, here we are, I have the Rotman Chair in Artificial Intelligence and Healthcare. There's a sense that healthcare management uh, around AI is exciting, uh, so that's the hope. Um, but then there's a fair bit of hype and fear around, uh, well, if the machine's doing diagnosis, what's the role of the doctor? Uh, should we really trust machines? Is there a dark side? Is it going to create bias and all sorts of other problems? Uh, underlying the hope and the hype is really confusion about what we're talking about when we're talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, it may be tempting to jump to science fiction where we imagine that there are machines like uh, the robots in the matrix or uh, HAL from 2001 A Space Odyssey that can uh, think like human and do just about everything we humans do. Uh, I don't think that's crazy. Uh, I think that you know there's reasons to expect that to happen someday, but that day is not today and it is very unlikely to be in the immediate future. These kinds of technologies have been 20 to 50 years away since AI was really first being developed in the 1960s and they continue to be 20 to 50 years away. This is not the technology we're talking about today. The reason we have uh, books and panels and excitement about AI in 2022 is because a very particular technology uh, called machine learning has gotten much better. And in our first book, we framed uh, machine learning as you know, these improvements in machine learning over time as a drop in the cost of prediction. So we're economists. And so the simple economics of artificial intelligence, as we described it, is predictions getting better, faster, and cheaper. And so we're going to see all sorts of new applications for prediction that we might not have imagined before. Medical diagnosis being at the center of that. Because uh, prediction is the process of filling and missing information. And what is a diagnosis? A diagnosis is taking information, taking data about symptoms, and filling in the missing information of the cause of those symptoms. And because diagnosis is prediction, and diagnosis is central to healthcare, uh, we should expect transformation in healthcare. And so we started to see predictions used all over the place in mortgages and in insurance, uh, in image recognition, and of course in medicine. Um, a bunch of the startups at the Creative Destruction Lab built these companies around um, prediction tools. Um, and the excitement led uh, Jeff Hinton uh, a few years ago um, on stage at the Rotman School to say people should stop training radiologists now. It's completely obvious that within five years, deep learning is gonna do better than radiologists. It has been six years, and there's still lots of demand for radiologists. Interestingly, it's ambiguous about whether deep learning is doing better at certain tasks than radiologists, but we still need lots of radiologists. And so what we see is this um, uh, framing of this extraordinary potential of AI, right? We say, hey, uh, prediction's getting cheaper. Prediction's a big deal. Maybe, like, maybe AI is going to be an even bigger deal or as big a deal as, as electricity. Because we can imagine predictions are important. They help us make better decisions. Decision making is the central function of many organizations and of management. And so if we're going to do better decisions, that's going to be ubiquitous. It's going to be transformative, just like electricity. 
And then we look at the data. And the data tell us something like this, which is if you look at the fraction of jobs by industry, for example, that use machine learning schools, skills, that use AI skills, uh, the industry with the most AI is the information industry, like computing, and that's still only 3% of jobs. Okay? Healthcare and social assistance, and social assistance, by the way, is beating out healthcare. It's just this is how the categories work, uh, is to a fraction of a percentage. It's ahead of construction, but well behind arts, entertainment, and recreation. The uh, in the skills required in in healthcare hiring to be uh, at the cutting edge. And if you look at adoption data at the firm level, the hospital level, whatever it might be, we see over and over again healthcare is a laggard in AI adoption. So we have this extraordinary hope and a vision for what AI and healthcare can do, but still, as of today, it hasn't had that impact. So why hasn't it had an impact? Well, if AI is the new electricity, maybe we need to dig into understanding electricity. So electricity uh, you know, started to be commercially useful in the 1880s. And for those people who were paying attention, it was pretty clear that electricity was going to transform the way we lived and the way we worked. Electric lights, electric motors, and other things. And yet it wasn't until the 1920s that half of all households and half of all factories in the US were electrified. And so why did it take so long? Well, this is what a factory would have looked like around the 1880s. And you can see all the machines are connected by these um, belts to a shaft across the top of the factory that in turn, that shaft is connected to a, um, to a steam engine. And the steam engine is the center of energy in the factory. And so what they do is they organize the factory around the steam engine, where the most power hungry machines were located close to the steam engine and the least power hungry machines were located far away because the farther away they were from the steam engine, the more energy dissipated. So some enterprising factory owners said, wait, we have this electricity. It's cheap power in some contexts. Let's take out our steam engine and put an electric motor. And they did, and they saved on energy. They might have saved 10, 15, even 20% on the costs of power. But it didn't transform, didn't change anything they did. And so there wasn't that much enthusiasm for actually adopting the technology. So that by 1900 even, we only saw five to 10% of factories having adopted AI. This first wave is what we call point solutions. You take your existing workflow, you figure out how can we pull out something we're doing already, drop in our new technology, but don't mess with the workflow. And a lot of what we've seen in healthcare so far are these point solutions where, oh, we're not gonna change our workflow because that can mess things up. We'll just take out something and put in something else. And for most organizations, just like back here with electricity, with most factories, that was kind of underwhelming and not worth the effort. Because if you're not changing your workflow, you're not getting that much out of the technology and you still have to invest in uh, you know, in the context of electricity and wiring and all sorts in distribution and all sorts of other things. But then people realized that electricity wasn't just cheap power. It was distributed power. It allowed you to decouple the machines from the power source. And once you could decouple the machines from the power source, you could do all sorts of new things. You could design your workflow around inputs coming in one end of the factory and outputs coming out the other. You could create modular production processes. Uh, light construction, you can make things, uh, use lots of land, single story, you move your factories from cities to cheap land in rural areas so that you could uh, build them over huge spaces with inputs in one end and outputs in the other, not worried about the placement of the machines and the tight uh, uh, coupling of the machine and the power source. Mm -hmm. And it's then in around 1900 when these innovations started happening that we see the kink in the curve and uh, adoption of electricity in factories start to rise. And, over, and by 1920, that's when we saw the median household, median factory adopting. So it took 40 years to go from, oh yeah, electricity is clearly useful to it's worth it for most factories to bother to invest in electric motors in electrification. I think we're in those 40 years wandering in the desert or the between times uh, for 
oh, for AI right now. We see the potential of the technology. Prediction technology is transformative, I believe, but it hasn't yet uh, had its impact across many industries and especially in healthcare. We focused on building lots and lots and lots of point solutions, but no system level solution. Just to give you a sense of an example of a point and system solution. So in the taxi industry, they've been adopting AI in all sorts of places. So uh, Zenrin is um, a company, they built an AI to help taxi drivers predict where there can be people to, to pick up rides. And uh, you know, the technology worked pretty well. And uh, you know, a taxi company, for example, adopted it and their low skilled drivers became 14% more effective or you know, narrowed the gap between them and their highest skilled drivers by 14%. We have lots of examples of these technologies that are adopted by existing industries into existing workflows. And we get this, oh, you know what? The people who are okay at it now suddenly are a little bit better. That's very different from a system level change where you take AIs based on where you think uh, you know, people are gonna need rides and AIs based on the best directions from one place to another, combined with digital uh, tools to enable dispatch and create an entirely new kind of transportation system. It's going from the point solutions to system level change. So let's think through new systems. As I said, in healthcare, if you look up AI in healthcare, there's a lot of research providing point solutions to existing problems. If you Google Scholar search artificial intelligence and health, you get 2 million results. There's a lot of people thinking about this stuff. And so we're seeing these point solutions all over the place. And yet at the bottom line, they haven't made a meaningful difference in most, uh, you know, in most company, in most healthcare organizations, in most hospitals and elsewhere, they've okay. We uh, we can do some things a little bit better than we used to, and maybe a handful of leading hospitals are adopting, but it hasn't been widespread. And if you look at the growth in in AI devices over time, so software's in the dotted line, we started to see a growth in approved AI devices around 2017. Uh, but if you look at that that y-axis, the number is still 80. Okay as of 2021, it's still extraordinarily small compared to say software devices. We're a long way away from seeing this have an impact at scale. Because, you know, that should be no surprise given how little expertise there is in, in the healthcare industry. Okay, I wanna talk about um, two people who did build one of these point solution AIs. So Sendel Lanathan and Ziad Obermeyer. Sendel is an economist in Chicago. He won the Genius Award for, for being a genius. And um, Ziad is a medical doctor at School of Public Health University at UC Berkeley. Um, and um, he doesn't think of himself as a card carrying economist, but we economists tend to think of him as one. Okay. And they wrote this paper on diagnosing uh, whether somebody was having a heart attack when they arrived in the emergency department. And what they found is um, under current processes, doctors get it right about 15% of the time. So about 15% of the time, they think somebody's having a heart attack, they are, and you know, um, and roughly the same proportionally in terms of when they say they're not, uh, when they say they're not, they're very, very unlikely uh, to be having a heart attack. It's the risk averse for good reason. And so Sentinel and Ziad built a machine learning tool to predict whether somebody was having a heart attack. And they found that their machine learning tool was about 50% better than the doctor's. Okay, so the doctors were 15%, they were you know, somewhere in the low, between 20 and 25% accurate. Seems amazing, right? And uh, they wanted to deploy it, but you know, they're academics. First thing they did was write a paper. No one was interested in the paper that said, hey, we can do 50% 50, 50 better. So they instead wrote a paper about how uh, all the biases doctors have in trying to diagnose heart attacks. In particular, if somebody doesn't have chest pain, they miss it. Okay. Uh, you guys don't miss it. I'm not saying you guys miss it. That's, they're missed way too often. Okay. So in that paper that they decide, you know, and a part they decided not to publish, it's in the online appendix three, they talk about what happens when somebody is, um, uh, when somebody's likely to be having a heart attack, when they predict somebody is having a heart attack. So in emergency departments, so the ones they were working with, first thing that happened is he went stress testing. So these are these treadmills and uh, and uh, they have measurements 
and they um, and they do stress testing and figure out, well, okay, uh, is this person pretty likely to be having a heart attack? And if they are, then they we go straight to catheter. Then we go to catheterization where it's a surgery where they can determine for sure whether somebody's having a heart attack or effectively for sure. And in the process, put in a treatment, put in a stent while they're doing that. And what Sendel, Malena, Sendel and uh, Ziad uh, pointed out is when their predictions are good enough, you're not gonna do stress testing. If you knew with 99% certainty that somebody was having a heart attack, you'll send them straight to catheterization. You'll skip the stress testing. That will change the process in the emergency department but now the resource benefit is bigger. Now, sure, a 99% accurate, for sure, anyone's gonna do it and we'll skip the stress testing and we're all fine. Problem is you don't get, to, you don't get from 15 to 99 overnight. You need to go step-by-step step and collect more data. And in the interim, 30, 50%, uh, it might make sense from the administration point of view to say, you know what, we don't wanna dedicate space to stress testing because we can use that space uh, better in some other way. But the doctors still like having the option to stress test on a patient by patient basis. So the administrators and the doctors disagree. And that leads to challenges. And so far that's led to, uh, in this context, um, barriers to adopting the technology in the first place. Cause that extra 50% just might not be worth the change in processes necessary in order to implement. So this can then be uh, moved to scale. Uh, this can then be moved to scale, which is, okay, so that's what happens at the door of the emergency department. Now, imagine we have better predictions going way back. So not just at the door of the emergency department, imagine when you call 911, is a prediction of what's wrong with you. Okay. Lots of things need to change. We need better data, we need better sensors. Uh, but if we had a prediction of what was wrong with you when you called 911, an ambulance and a police car, um, with generic skills, you could instead, instead send an ambulance with a paramedic who had expertise in whatever was wrong with you. And the ambulance itself would have equipment based on whatever was wrong with you. And so we could get people treatment faster. And maybe some people could even be treated at home. Some people would have to be uh, sent to the hospital. They'd be sent to the right hospital for the right reasons. This is possible conceptually with better prediction, but it's hard. And I'm hoping Emil, Chris, and Helen uh, you know, start to think through what makes this so hard to get all of these different pieces in the healthcare system working together in order to make transformative change. So thank you very much. Perfect. Time for questions, time for next. Okay. So we're going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to go straight to Amal and uh, Amal hope for you to uh, uh, continue on on the, on the clinical side. So go ahead. Okay, thanks. So I have five minutes, which means I'm going to try to make three points and tell one story. And it doesn't add up to five, but I'm not an economist. So um, uh, I'm actually going to share with you a story about a point solution uh, that Avi was talking about that we developed here um, at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. But the three uh, key points that I want to make in this five minutes are first, that AI solutions can improve care, they can save lives. But they need to be implemented very carefully, and hopefully my illustration will show some examples of that. Second is that AI will not achieve its impact at scale in healthcare until we redesign our data systems. That is the central underlying fundamental challenge. And then finally, labels are gold, and we'll dive into that in a little bit. Okay, but first, let me tell you a story about a point solution. So I was taking, I'm going to tell you a patient story with some uh, details obscured to protect the, the privacy of that individual uh, and their family. But, you know, some years ago, I was taking care of a 73-year-old man who was hospitalized with a gallbladder infection. And so he underwent uh, an advanced procedure where they, you know, put a camera in and they pull out the infected gallstones and everything went well. And he was getting ready to go home the next day. And around 6.30 PM, we got a phone call saying hey, he's feeling a bit short of breath. So we went to go check on, on him and we ordered an x-ray of his chest, some blood work, said, we'll come back and see you in the morning. And uh, uh, overnight, it seemed to be all right, you know, nothing too terrible. The next morning, 8.30, we showed up, we got a phone call urgently from the nurse saying he was in extreme distress, his blood pressure had decreased. He, uh, we went to the bedside immediately um, and uh, he told us he did not want intensive care and he ended up passing away that day. 
His family was extremely distraught. They had spent their time with him in the day yesterday and they'd left uh, overnight. And they said we would never have left uh, his bedside if we'd known that he was going to pass away. This scenario is unfortunately very recognizable, I think, by any clinician that does inpatient care. And the reason it's recognizable is that the number one cause of unplanned transfer to an intensive care unit is a failure to rescue patients because we don't recognize clinical deterioration early enough. And so we developed an AI solution to that, which is exactly what Avi highlighted. If we can predict who is likely to deteriorate in advance, maybe that can give us an early warning signal. And so we developed a solution called ChartWatch at St. Michael's Hospital that uses about 100 inputs from the hospital's electronic medical record, and every hour produces an hourly updated prediction of which patients are likely to uh, go to the ICU or die in hospital. We uh, shared this model with our clinician colleagues, and they said, great, how do you, I know it's better than I am. And we said, okay, let's test it. So we sent a research assistant to the hospital ward, and we asked physicians and nurses every day, which of their patients are likely to deteriorate in hospital. We compared it to the model predictions. And the model is better at predicting uh, uh, ICU deterioration than physicians by 15 to 20%, kind of exactly like what uh, uh, Avi meant, the story Avi told us about. Um, and most importantly, the combination of human and model predictions is better than either alone, which is quite interesting. So the, the things they get wrong are different. So we um, uh, worked actually with a large interdisciplinary team, patients and their families, nurses, physicians, uh, administrators, to figure out what do we do for high-risk patients? We created a pathway for them and we implemented it in September 2020, and the, uh, the, the project has been ongoing with the goal of reducing unplanned mortality. And our preliminary data, the detailed evaluation is underway, but the preliminary data suggests that we've seen about a 10 to 20 percent reduction in unplanned deaths on our unit and about a 10 to 20 percent increase in the delivery of urgent care or end-of-life care for people who need it. So not only are we hopefully preventing unplanned deaths, but also easing the suffering of those who have unpreventable deaths. Um, and so this is an example of that point solution. And in fact, we took great pains to make this solution match the workflow, to not disrupt the existing workflows, because that would have created turmoil on our unit, right? So this is exactly the de definition of a point solution. But the problem is it's designed so tailored for our organization that it has no relevant, like it's, you couldn't take this and just instantly plop it in somewhere else. So it has no scalability. Um, and so uh, the hospital has actually partnered with an AI startup called Signal One to actually try to scale it. But that requires a lot of capital, a lot of resources, and we're nowhere near the ability to have system change. So that's my, um, my anecdote. Uh, I'll, I'll conclude just to make a couple of uh, uh, quick points and, and, and end with um, some, some brief uh, scenarios from actual chart watch patients. But um, I said to you that AI will not achieve impact at scale without designing or redesigning our data systems. And that's because AI needs vast quantities of data to learn. And right now, our data are siloed into individual organizations. So it's not going to learn. And also, what it learns for one organization will not be relevant for another. So that until we solve that problem, we're not going to get scalable solutions. Embedded within our data are lots of biases, and I'm hoping that AI is a mirror that shows us those biases and allows us to change and fix them. And then finally, I, I said the point that labels are gold. So what that means, right now we can only predict the things that are easy to measure, labeled data sets. And it takes huge investment to actually garner those labels. What, we, what that means is we can predict death, we can predict heart attacks to some extent, but we cannot predict whether a patient was in pain and how long they were in pain, or whether they were treated with dignity. More importantly, uh, even with the heart attack example, um, defining a heart attack, given that it looks different for different people, women have different symptoms with a heart attack than men, our labels are wrong. The labels in healthcare that we can currently predict are flawed. And so you can deploy an AI solution to measure something, but unless it's, it's why we landed on ICU and mortality, because those are pretty hard endpoints. But until we decide what is important to measure and make major investments to actually collect data on that in a way that's fair and unbiased, we will not, AI will just drive towards what's easy to measure. And that's not where we want to be. Uh, so I'll conclude there. Amal, I've, I've heard you tell this story four times. And I just, 
listening this time, I have one question for you. Do you know which of the people on your current team are best at predicting decompensation? Like you, you asked them, which one of them was best at it? Do you know, and do you know why? Yeah, it, great question. We know that there's variation. We know that there is large variation. It does, interestingly, we also know that there is some association. So the, the, the more experienced physicians were better than the more junior physicians at predicting. And the physicians in general were a little bit better than nurses. I don't think that has to do with clinical experience. I think it has to do with the way our system is organized where a nurse may care for a patient just on one day or one shift and then come see a different person at a different time. And so what that means though, is the added value of an algorithm is more relevant for people either more junior in their training or who have less direct interaction with a patient. Um, so it helps make those decisions when you don't have that same longitudinal experience. Whereas our, um, and so maybe for example, it's actually more useful earlier in a patient's visit, right? When you get to know them. So uh, lots of opportunities for, re we're sort of studying those exact questions right now, but yeah, it's a great question. Perfect. Chris, over to you, man. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, great to be here. Appreciate the time. Uh, Chris O'Connor, I wear a number of different hats. I'm a practicing critical care physician at Trillion Health Partners. And I can say at this time, my practice is completely untouched by anything to do with prediction machines or artificial intelligence. It could be 1980 for all the impact. And so as I think an interesting thing, and I will come back to that sort of as sort of where are we right now moment. The other hat that I wear is that I'm a serial entrepreneur. I founded a company called Think Research back in 2006, grew it up to 200 employees with projects in eight countries, United States, Iceland, Ireland, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, and basically we're deploying structured knowledge-based checklists, trying to improve care and uh, grew it up, was quite successful. And then it went public at the end of 2020. I had an exit and I left. And then I became just shortly after doing that, uh, I became the CEO of First History. And what First History is doing, is, I think it's very germane to uh, the conversation here is that we are digitizing or codifying an area of medical knowledge that at this point in time is largely uncodified, which is how do we take histories for patients? What's the knowledge that we need and how do we apply it to patients? And so we are growing that and trying to scale it. And we're actually trying to build the flywheel that Abby uh, talks about in his book that will deploy these structured, this knowledge, will have a smart application to deploy it at the point of care where it'll engage with patients, clinicians, and the enterprise. Then we will get data from how it is deployed and how it's used. And then we can feed that data back up and in a sort of a vir virtuous a learning cycle. And um, uh, I would I'd just like to give a quick shout out to Abby's book, hugely helpful. As an entrepreneur, actually, I liked his original book. It was great, I read it. This book is even better. Because as an entrepreneur, it helps situate what you're doing in context. And it actually, it's highly usable. And I, I found it was great. And I've only had a week with the book. It's the kind of book where you don't want to binge this book. You actually want to read it in little chunks <laughs> and then think about the points he makes and then you know take your time with it. And it, it's very useful that way. So in terms of why, why is it that when I'm practicing a Trillium right now, I'm completely untouched by prediction machines right now. I think there's a number of different reasons. We've only got an hour. We couldn't begin to discuss all the reasons uh, that are here, but I'll highlight three big ones, I think. First is medical knowledge. Ultimately, patient care is about applying medical knowledge to patients. At this point in time, medical knowledge is largely uncodified. Uh, a lot of it's not digital. A lot of it sits in clinicians' brains. And when it is written down, it's unstructured, not machine readable. And it's far more complex than people appreciate. So a lot of people think that medical knowledge is just simple if-then rules. So think about IBM Watson, Jeopardy, 2011. A lot of people thought, oh my goodness, Watson won at Jeopardy, medicine is next. It's gonna take medicine down because medicine is straightforward. Well, a decade later, as you know, IBM sold Watson and it sold it precisely for the reason is that they didn't have the medical knowledge to make Watson work. So knowledge is super complicated and hard. I don't think we should underestimate that. The second thing which has already been discussed is obviously data. Data is huge. Uh, data in healthcare is either a lot of, there's, for a fully electronic system, there's a lot of paper around. A lot of it's still in people, not digital format. 
When it is digital, all too often, it's still unstructured free, free text narrative notes, which is a huge problem. Even with natural language processing or DPT free, you still have a bit of a garbage in garbage out problem. You have missing data, erroneous data. And I think that, I think that is really difficult for today's AI systems. And then the third point, and this is another part of the book that I that I really like, it's the electricity metaphor. You know, it's like it's 1882, like we're just early. And so the whole ecosystem is not ready. And I was just reflecting back on my own life. I mean, the analogy that would also apply, like in terms of computing, it's 1982. Like you've got the guy down the street, super excited. He's got his early Mac with his like his floppy disk or his tape drive. But, you know, it's had no impact on your life yet. Nobody's using word processing. Nobody's using PowerPoint. And it was interesting that that cycle sort of in terms of personal computing, you know, just being a few hobby enthusiasts to where everybody on this call, it's ubiquitous and it's sort of achieved at least its initial premise. That was also a 40 year cycle as well, too. And so from an entrepreneurial perspective, I think it's just it's important to be mindful of that of that of that cycle. This is not going to change overnight. And you know, you talk about the glue of the system. And from practical impact, you have to be mindful of that because the last thing you want to do is build a solution that then doesn't work because precisely because the system's not ready, the ecosystem isn't ready yet. So that's uh I think those are three of the many, many factors. And, and so Chris, your central premise is that structured data comes next in the path towards obvious central solutions. Absolutely agree. And, it, and the thing I'll just one last thing about sex, uh, the data, the structure, knowledge based data, it's structure, it's knowledge, it's completely unglamorous. <laughs> you know, it's not, you know, AI, ML, but it's absolutely foundational. And without that, we're going to find that we, we can't even really get out the starting gate, I don't think. Mentally, you, know, you said you said nothing uh, um, uh, around uh, prediction machines, but but you use. ECGs um, all day long and twice on Sunday. Where do you mentally position an ECG versus versus and maybe Avi, I'll come back to you on this later. But where do you where do you see ECGs versus prediction machines? So good point. I stand corrected. That's the one example. So I do use ECGs. I get a printout when I read the ECG, which is it's pretty good. No, one hundred percent, but it actually is useful. So that's the one place. Um, where I actually do have a prediction machine in my practice. Pulmonary function tests are the same, but they're way off at the margins of practice. They're not, they're not the core of, you know, of, of what we do at this point in time. Um, but it's also interesting in terms of the point solution, like the ECG is a point solution, but it's had no impact on my overall pattern of practice, has an impact on workflow or anything. So it's, it's useful, but it's certainly not transformative. Okay. And that was Helen? a useful framework in terms of point solutions, application solutions, and then system change. That's definitely a point solution that has, you know, as a it's good, but it's still limited. It's not transformative. Okay. Helen? Great. Well, thank you. Um, this is a great topic, and I also really enjoyed the book. So I, I come to this with, you know, three perspectives. Will's introduced me as a former deputy minister of health. Um, I was also the executive responsible for um, the Ontario Renal Network, where of the many people who had declining kidney function, I wish we could have predicted those that were going to progress to dialysis and be able to avoid the 25% crash starts that we see still today. And of course, as the CEO of AMS Healthcare, where we, I'm going to be a, put a plug in here, where we actually provide grants uh, and fellowships to look at how technology can be integrated uh, into care. Um, while keeping a, sort of a, a grounding in, in compassion. So, you know, I tend to be on the Eric Topol side of the equation in terms of being optimistic about the uses of AI, you know, given my own experience, but I do see some really big structural reasons consistent with Avi's thesis about why it hasn't been introduced into healthcare. And I think about some of the things that I've tried to implement um, both at Cancer Care Ontario and at the ministry and found that you know, the spread of innovation, never mind transformation um, in healthcare is often slow and difficult. And even in systems that are better organized and I'm struck by a fact that has stuck with me um, over a period of years that even in, in the Kaiser Permanente system that we sometimes point to as being you know, better than one that we have, uh, it takes seven years on a, you know, for some innovations to move from, from one location to another. 
So there's something about healthcare um, that makes it less conducive to the spread of innovation and, and particularly the, the use of AI. And I came up with a list and we'll see whether that holds water with the clinicians who actually work in the system. So it, it's a very complex system and it's often a non-system um, as has been pointed out to me many times with powerful vested interests and aligning effort can be difficult under the best of, of circumstances. Uh, the costs of change can be daunting, and I think you've got some examples of that already. And there's lots uh, embedded in the current way of doing things, and so change is difficult. Uh, certainly, I found that we've got a lot of right dollar, wrong pocket kinds of issues in healthcare where the incentives are misaligned. So the benefits of change in one part of the system, uh, including in AI, or as I think, Abby, you point out in your book as well, are distributed. Um, across an organization. And so, um, you know, the, the full kind of calculation of costs and benefits aren't, aren't realized, uh, but they can also impose costs on other parts of the system or affect income uh, for people working in the system. And, and certainly that works against uh, innovation and it really requires systems level thinking and levers um, to be able to unlock that kind of value and uh, I would say um, it's not just the, the, the shining examples of, of, of uh, point solutions, uh, but I think it's also things like funding models and others that uh, really need to be uh, sort of integrated into the, the rollout of AI. Uh, you've talked about the reverse, uh, the risk adverse culture. And uh, so I don't want to add to that. I will add my voice to the data issues. And particularly at a time when we're looking at the, you know, the challenges, and I would say even crisis in health human resources, we have very little data um, on some really important aspects of healthcare delivery that we could use to actually see around corners and, uh, you know, predict or even model out um, different kinds of solutions. Um, certainly, the, you know, in the work that uh, I've seen, you know, again, at, at Cancer Care Ontario in particular, there's been a lot of uses of retrospective data, you know, that arrives late, um, that is backward looking. Uh, it's important, um, but I think the forward looking analysis that is part of um, the AI offering is probably never been more pressing in order to be able to put that to use as we face some of the challenges uh, in, in the health sector. I was struck, um, for those of you who are going to read the book, um, you know, even some, uh, uh, some of us, uh, you know, I was in the middle of the, the COVID response, but certainly uh, found the example of the Creative Destruction Lab and the work that was done on uh, sort of alternatives to widespread lockdowns. Interesting, uh, challenging to imagine, you know, how you would implement that from a social political perspective, but still uh, a fascinating example of um, maybe some value that we didn't optimize uh, during uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. There are issues related to you know, capacity, uh, maybe even demand data scientists, uh, leadership, and I'll make a plug here. Um, uh, like Rotman, we are actually working with the, the University of Toronto to offer a leadership program in AI that I think will be helpful because I think understanding how to, to lead, deal with systems issues, um, communicate um, the uses of AI are gonna be uh, really important if we're gonna implement this at scale. There are a whole host of issues that are generic, I think, to, to AI that uh, you know, governments are starting uh, to, to grapple with. Privacy concerns, transparency, uh, right to, rights to, uh, I guess, sort of look at, uh, I guess, either look at a human review um, from a patient perspective if uh, there isn't trust in what is produced by the AI use of plain language, um, the accountability and oversight of, of uses of AI, feedback loops, um, public involvement, um, and certainly the sort of role of government in terms of rules, processes, tools, um, and support safe and secure use of AI. So we've got a fair distance to go. Um, <laughs> that's just kind of what I kind of thought up over the weekend after reading the book, and I'm sure we'll have a more intelligent discussion here. But I'm not... Uh, I guess, uh, you know, I'm not pessimistic about it because I, I do believe, as you pointed out nicely, that we're in the time in between. And so some of these things will be resolved. It's just going to require some effort uh, in the next few years because I think the, the business case for using AI is more pressing than ever. And I'll stop there.
Well, you, you guys have been tr tremendous, all, all four of you, in terms of uh, setting this up. You've also been unbelievably content rich. And I'm really struggling as to exactly how I'm going to moderate the four of you uh, in a discussion. But the first step is easy, which is I'm going to go back to Avi first and just say, Avi, quick uh, response to the three commentators. And then I think maybe I'll go to the data stuff with an Amal's question for Chris. Okay. Um, thanks so much. That was, um, I learned so much from your, from your three ideas and responses. So uh, Emil first, you know, the, you know, what you're doing is a point solution, hundred percent. And what signal one is doing, I love what signal one is doing. And, and currently it's being framed as a point solution because that's the way you sell it. Uh, but, I'd like to hope it won't stop there because even the simple example you gave, which is we can now, uh, people with less training are better at their jobs, okay? Well, one version of it is, okay, we just accept it and people with less training are a little bit better at their jobs. Another version is it changes the training and it changes the people. And now we start thinking about system level change. You know, it depends you know, the algorithms have to get much better, but as they get better, we can start to reimagine you know, the, the humans we have in the hospital and what their roles are, what their expertise needs to be, which gets at a point that, uh, you know, Helen, you talked about in the context of Eric Topol and being an optimist. Um, so, you know, Eric Topol says what AI can do is allow healthcare to be human again. Okay. And that sounds wonderful. I don't think that's happening with point solutions. What's happening with point solutions is we're sticking with the original processes and it allows us to actually spend less time with patients uh, because, you know, if sometimes and not rather than more because we're just working through our existing workflows. What we, uh, what I think you're imagining in your, in your optimistic scenario, but correct me if I'm wrong, is a system level solution where uh, because we have better predictions in some places, we can then you know, do all sorts of other things differently. Now to Chris, 100% you're right, a first order issue, like none of this can happen without good data. Okay. Um, but, investing in data isn't worth it if all we're doing is point solutions. And so I think like one of the reasons why we such, such, such slow adoption of electricity in factories, it wasn't just that we hadn't imagined the new systems. It was, you know, for the 10, 20% uh, lift that you were going to get in power costs for most factories, that just wasn't worth it okay, to figure out how to electrify. And I think- But isn't, every, isn't everything we do, Avi, in healthcare, at least at the clinical levels, isn't everything we do geared towards best practice? Isn't best practice almost by definition a point solution replacement? I feel like that's a question for someone who's not me. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I'll try it, but I mean, evidence-based yeah. medicine usually involves comparing right. this one sure. with this one. You walk through and, your workflow. And and I'm sure I'll I make see. it a question for okay. you. You speak in the book. You speak in the book about Christensen. Yeah. Where, where, and how do we create opportunity, even for point solutions, to come in if they're less good than the existing standard of practice? Um, well, it's, if the point solution is less good than the existing standard of practice, it's going to. You know, I'm saying like, no, I agree with you. I, I just think it's not going to happen. Um, and we need to figure out ways to train data. Uh, to make it better than the existing standard practice. But even then, I think even if it's better than the existing standard, uh, it's got to be a lot better to be worth the investment. So, Emil, seems like you want to jump in there. Yeah, I was just going to sort of push back a little on Will's comment about sort of healthcare being point solutions because of the framing of this sort of evidence-based practice, one thing versus the other, which is that I think there is, a, like, of course, there are systems ways of, you know, ultimately the decisions made at the front line are partially driven by evidence-based medicine, but largely driven by the constraints of the system we work in, right? Like mostly we're not spending optimal evidence-based time with every patient and doing everything you would say. It's, we're like constrained by all the factors around us. And I think that's where the opportunities are. Let me just make one observation, which is, we exist in the hardest time from an information management perspective for healthcare providers in the history of medicine, right? So in the 1980s, um, a, a radiologist saw one image, right? They saw the one x-ray that they had access to and they interpreted it and they moved on with their lives. Now they have these PACS systems that lets them look at 20 years of imaging for a patient. 
And it's their job to compare today's image with all of the previous images. And they don't have the tools to, and so like as, and the, the parallel is as a, as a physician in the eMERGE, okay? My patient um, has many, many decades of medical history. When I was a clerk, a medical student, we just ignored it. We couldn't get access to the information. We would fax over a request for records to somebody and it would show up like three days later, right? So we just ignored it. And, and, and Avi, in your first book, you talked very clearly about the complementarity in the radiology example. And, and I'll bring both you and Helen in on this because we have made a whole generation of radiologists very wealthy. Using using algorithms and machine learning. I mean, I, I mean, radiology salaries, radiologist salaries have gone up and up and up and up. So, yeah. is complement is where does complementary technology fit back in with your new point solution system solution? And to what extent does complementarity link the two? And is that a pathway in? So. Um, so by complementarity, we mean uh, the, you know, the things that get more valuable as prediction tools get better. Okay, so uh, data being number one, uh, judgment, which is effectively what do you do with the prediction once you have it, is number two. Um, and if you unpack a radiologist workflow, um, you can, you know, depending on who you talk to, there's something like 29 different things that radiologists do. Okay, and two of them have to do with, uh, you know, predicting the content of an image. So there's 27 other things. And what we've seen so far is as they get more efficient and effective at those two, using digital tools for the most part, not AI so far, um, they're, they've been able to do a lot more images and just the way our point solution systems you know, process works is that means that they're reading, uh, you know, they're more efficient at the same thing and they get you know, paid per scan. And so they get paid more. Um, a, you know, envisioning a system solution on radiology is not necessarily about paying them less, uh, but it's about once you have a great prediction, can you do more with it than just have the radiologist feed information back to, um, you know, back to whoever is responsible for interacting with the patient? Um, or could you have, you know, does this supercharge other medical professionals? Does it mean that some intermediary is no longer necessary or needs different skills. Does this make healthcare human again? Because we no longer uh, require um, expertise in diagnosis to interpret what the radiologist said. Instead, we need somebody who's really good at managing patients. So I, I think I have lots of questions. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I, I, I'm going to go to you, um, not to Helen on this, because um, I think that I'm correct in saying that one of the things that better interpretation and PAC systems has allowed is for other people to step in and look at images themselves without even necessarily involving radiologists as early. Is that correct? Okay, yes, that, that is true. Know. And so PACs have had a number of impacts that have been positive. Your workflows, you used to have to go down to a film library and get this thing called a film. And then you actually had to put it up like old fashioned Marcus Welby style. So that's all gone. There are huge efficiencies associated, associated with that. It's not an AI thing, but it's, it's very transformative. Um, and, but it, that is a necessary step. When you think about the journey, you needed that step first to set the foundation for AI, for AI to get going. And I think, you know, in the same sense now, we need to get all the different pieces together. We need the regulatory, the legal framework, we need the cultural acceptance of this. Um, I remember in the early zeros, I, uh, when BlackBerry had been out for a while and everybody was all excited, uh, medicine was all pagers. So I thought, well, I'll give Blackberries to everybody in the ICU. We can all send each other wireless emails. Intuitive idea, right? But you had to go through a thicket of difficulties. Hospitals used to have cell phone bands. So you had to turn over the hospital cell phone band way back in the day for people who can remember that. And then clinicians liked their pagers. They didn't want to give it up for a wireless email. And I think we're going to encounter a similar thing as we as we deploy these digital things. And Abby, you referred to any like the glue of the system will bog these things down. And so the implication I would say for the entrepreneurs in the audience is get your value now from the point solutions because you can get those to go, deliver real value, and then create the foundation where we can start to build up from that foundation towards making system change. 
Because as much as I'd like to wave a magic wand and go, well, we're going to go system right now, the, the, all the pieces mostly at this point in time aren't, aren't, aren't ready for that, I don't think. Right. So don't you need to work with Helen? either some early adopters or, you know, some organizations that are actually willing to change some of the rules of the game for this in, to be able to be implemented, you know, to its fullest potential, because you're absolutely right. It's going to impact, well, you're talking about pricing, but funding models and who does what and everything else. And then there are some organizations, and we found that through health links and through Ontario health teams that are more kind of ready to take that on rather than expecting that to be implemented. I'm not saying that's what you're saying, but you know, evenly across the system and in fine places, do more point solutions and find places that uh, can take this on and uh, start to change some of the structures and relationships and build some of the capacities that are necessary for this really to have system impact, right? Uh, Amal, I want to get you in on this because I know you have some thoughts about how we might regulate some of these AIs going forward. I'm uh, thinking here of your drug analogy. Yeah, the, the fundamental challenge with regulating AI and why it's different from other software devices or other drug devices, there are two. One is the personalized element, and the second is the continuously learning element. So from the personalized element perspective, you know, you take a pill, pills are not personalized. So I do my RCT, I run my randomized trial in like 10,000 patients, I demonstrate that it's effective and I get approval and it's off to the races and I prescribe it in everyone. And in fact, drug companies want to have as broad a prescribing base as possible, right? So you want that solution to be as generically uh, uh, applicable as possible. Whereas uh, AI solutions are not like that. They learn powerfully in patterns with specific context. And generally, when and this is true of most scientific AI developments, like in the, in the computer science literature, when they try to take it out of the literature and then put it into some other real world environment, it fails to generalize to that setting and it doesn't work so well. And so thinking about how to regulate that, like what is the standard required to demonstrate that this is a safe technology is really challenging. And then the second part is it's going to keep learning. So I can't just say this version of that technology is correct, right? And how do we maintain that so that it ensures that what it learns is what we want it to learn and not that it's like learning inaccurate things. Just to give a super quick example would be in the example of ChartWatch, once you implement the solution and let's say physicians start saving lives of high-risk patients, if I then keep using my data to up to retrain my model because I need to keep it fresh, right? Um, what's going to happen is the model is going to start forgetting all the lives we saved because those people didn't die or go to the ICU. It protects death and ICU. So the patients who the clinicians saved their lives, where the model was the most useful, are the people that the model will stop recognizing if you retrain the model in that environment. It's called a feedback loop. How do you solve that problem? It's a real challenge, right? And we don't have good approaches for sustaining AI solutions once they're implemented in real world practice. And so how, as a regulator, how do you approach that? Challenging. Chris, Chris, I wanna to go to you on structured data because I, I know it's a passion of yours. Yeah, absolutely. The thing I like about implementing structured data, and I guess I'm wearing a bit of my first history hat, is that we can see, like, you can't just do something because it's going to deliver some benefit five years or 10 years from now, because you're creating curated foundation for AI. The nice things about implementing structured knowledge sets now is it delivers an immediate benefit now. You know, and we've seen, we improve, we improve clinician efficiency by 25%, uh, patients like it 97%. We've got all this good proximate data now, and then that creates the foundation that then we can grow the data set, and then we're in the position. I think you need to go in that sequential step ways. You can't just start at system, you need to build it up. And then you need to, but the key move here, I think, is architecting your point solution with a mod, with a view to the next moves two or three steps out so that it's built so that you can scale as you go from point to application to system and so that you can grow that over time. Um, but yeah, start with immediate value. So what's, Avi, do you buy that? And if so, what's the intermediate solution? Okay. Um, I worry that if we start with immediate value, um, we end up with an organization that learns that the value is pretty mediocre. And so 
Um, you know, for the you know, when we right after prediction, our advice was start with easy wins. Figure out within your part of the domain of your organization, can you bring a prediction machine in and make things better? And uh, and people and then their man, their managers said, okay, you know, big deal. Uh, you made something a little bit more effective. Um, and so uh, you know, easy wins can work, but they need to be combined with some vision of how can this actually be something that the head of the organization would care about. Because if there's no vision from the easy win to the strategy, like to really affecting the top line or the bottom line or patient care, uh, then who cares? Um, then what you've shown is that this isn't a big deal. So I agree with you, Chris, but well, like, the, the, only the, a step the, one the, among many. The, the, I agree. The, I, and I agree with you. I think absolutely true. The issue, though, is that um, at that point, you make it such a big problem that you're leaving the deputy minister in the position of trying to figure out who to fund. And uh, my experience over the last 20 years is that having the central agencies pick the winners is not necessarily always a path to success. Um, Helen, you want to comment? Yeah, no, I, I would say that in healthcare projects and economic development and a whole bunch of areas, I don't think government is particularly good at picking winners. They should be creating the environment in which um, you know, success can happen. And so if, you know, public confidence is an issue, if leadership is an issue, if uh, there are rules that uh, are kind of orthodoxies that about how we do things that need to be changed, I think government can be, a, you know, a force for good. And, and ultimately, uh, you know, whether it's the good housekeeping seal, people will look to government for, you know, the confidence um, that an AI kind of meets a certain standard, doesn't have the biases, um, that has a feedback loop and those kinds of things. And that's probably where government effort is better applied than in picking individual projects or applications, particularly in a clinical environment where, uh, you know, we're just not, we're, it's not we anymore, but government isn't close enough to the ground to be able to do that. Um, Amal, um, how does that feel to you in in, in where you are and your your projects being held up as success? Are you getting the support you need? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's that's um, uh, right. When you think about like uh, you know from from a project point solution specific perspective, that's really about institutional support. I think Helen's point about sort of creating the groundwork, like a lot of these the challenges and barriers we articulated some of them are cultural some of them are regulatory and a lot of them are data and government has a huge role to play on all of those fronts i would say so it it does line up well i do think that the model has to be government creates fertile soil innovators create green shoots right and so you know i think that's hopefully where where we're going with all this yeah okay i'm i'm noting the clock and i'm going to give last word here to avi to see if you can summarize uh, and bring us home. Um, so just uh, thanks everybody for for being part of this um, and for for you know engaging with with the ideas that, that Jay Joshua and I put together and and building on them. Uh, so I've learned so much from from the four of you. Uh, you know, the maybe the big takeaway is, is uh, to the extent there is one, and putting this all together is is a version of what I uh, responded to Chris on data and easy wins, which is. Going for a system solution doesn't mean that you need billions of dollars in the short run and government support to make it happen. It means that the projects you choose should be ones that are a step toward a longer term goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't see that longer term goal, then there's a worry that ultimately the impact will be minimal and there'll be less enthusiasm for the technology in the organization. And I see the three of you nodding, so I think I did okay. Okay. So a building block approach that allows both individual wins, but also builds towards a vision. 
Yeah. Um, I, you, four of you are great. I, you know, Rosemary, I'm just thinking that we, we should think about doing another longer session on this, uh, Rotman, at some point. I'm so excited about the new book coming out, Avi, and uh, I'm, I'm going to buy a couple more copies for <laughs> Christmas gifts. Power and Prediction, available on November 15th. I always take I always take my book cover off, particularly when I'm in the hammock. Um, and uh, uh, Amal, Chris, and, and Helen, yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you very much for <laughs> your thoughtful oh. comments and for thinking and about this. Helen's got hers too. Um, awesome. I am told that, I'm told that we are back on February. We're, we're back on February the 8th. Uh, with our annual digital health startup scale up uh, session. I know we've got uh, four great um, startups or scale ups, maybe five uh, lined up. And so I hope that uh, folks will uh, join us again. And uh, thank you, everyone. That ends our uh, formal session. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks. thanks, everybody. And great book, Avi. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh,